In this video, we are going to talk about functions, limits, derivatives, and integrals. Let's start with functions. A function is a mathematical entity that gets some inputs, which are called the domain, and some outputs, which is the range of function. We can illustrate it as a graph. It's very important to know that we must have just one output for each input and we can't have two different f of x for an x. Now, look at these graphs. Which ones are functions? The green graph is a function because for each input we have just one output. The red one is not a function because for x's between x1 and x2 we have two outputs for each x. And the blue one is also a function because for each x we have a specific f of x. Let's take a look at some famous functions. Linear function, square function, cubic function, absolute value function, a square root function, reciprocal function, logarithmic function, exponential function, floor function, ceiling function, and finally trigonometric functions like sine, cosine, and tangent. Now consider these two functions. f of x is a one-to-one -one function because for each x we have a specific y. But g of x is not one-to-one -one because each input in this function doesn't correspond to exactly one output. The inverse of these functions is defined as an entity that gets y's as inputs and x's as outputs. The inverse of f of x is still a function because for every y we exactly have one x. But the inverse of g of x is not a function because there are elements that correspond to more than one output and therefore g of x inverse is not a function. So a function has an inverse if and only if it has a one-to-one -one correspondence between its elements. Take f of x equals x squared as an example. The domain is from 0 to infinity and the range is from 0 to infinity too. As you can see, it is a one-to-one -one function. So we can write its inverse as a function. What we need to do is to replace x and y with each other and find y in terms of x. The expression shows the inverse function. Its graph is illustrated in blue. Pay attention that f of x and its inverse are symmetrical with respect to line y equals x. So for every one-to-one -one graph, the inverse graph is its mirrored one with respect to line y equals x. To find the intersection points, we can solve this equation. And as you can see, we have two intersection points at 0 and 1. Finally, this equation holds for a function and its inverse. Now it's time to talk about limits. Look at these three functions. f a is 1, g a is 0, and h of x is 1 at point a. Right and left hand limits of f of x are respectively 2 and 1 and not equal. So this function doesn't have a limit at x equals a. For g of x, on the other hand, both are equal, and we can define the limit at x equals a to be 1. But the limit is not equal to g of a, so the function is not continuous. The green function limits are also equal and equal to the function at point a. And the function is continuous because for every point in h of x, this expression applies. So, if the right hand and left hand limits are equal at point A, the function has a limit in that point. And if the limits exist at a point and is equal to the value of the function at that point, we say that the function is continuous at that point. Now it's time to differentiate and find a derivative of a function. Take this function as an example. Let's choose two points on this function and find the slope of the line that connects them. We can calculate it like this. It can be rewritten as this expression. And if we take the limit of this expression as delta x goes to 0, we have a tangential line at point x1, which is called the derivative of this function at point x1. As you can see, the derivative of x with respect to x is 1, the derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x, 
And pay attention, the delta x squared goes to zero because delta x is very small and we can just ignore delta x squared when we have a very bigger term, 2x delta x. We can also show the derivative of a function by dy over dx, which are infinitesimal changes in y and x respectively. For example, suppose our function is y equals x2. If we change x infinitesimally, dy changes based on this expression. There are some examples of differentiation. I want you to pause the video and take a look at them and ask any questions you have regarding these derivatives. Finally, we are going to talk about integration and integrals. Take this function as an example. We want to find the area constraint under the function graph from A to B. We can estimate the area by dividing it into several boxes and sum over the area of all boxes. But it's just an estimate and not very exact. We can rewrite the sum in this form. By taking its limit as n goes to infinity, meaning that we have infinite boxes, we have the integral of f of x from a to b, which is exactly the area under the curve from a to b. This is called a definite integral. We also have indefinite integrals, which are antiderivatives. For example, if we take the derivative of x plus a constant with respect to x, it yields 1 and integrating the answer gives x plus a constant again. Or if we do this for sine x, it yields cosine x and the antiderivative is sine x again. More exactly, the integral of cosine x with respect to x yields sine x plus a constant. We must always consider a constant in our integration because the derivative of a constant with respect to x is always zero. There's a list of some basic integrals. And as an example, if we want to calculate the integral of a to the power of x with respect to x, we can use a method called change of variables to solve this integral. Take a look at it. Another useful method in integration is integration by parts. Suppose that we have two functions f and g. If we take the derivative of their product, we have this expression. Let's integrate over it, and the result is really useful as an integration method. As an example, we can easily find this integral using this technique, integration by parts.